Please visit sleepapia.org to get more videos like this one, as well as audio and blog content. Join us at sleepapnea.org to be included in the conversation and updated whenever new programs are available. Thanks for joining us and enjoy. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining sleepapnea.org for our weekly speaker series. We are happy uh, this week to present on the topic of UARS, Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome. And I'm happy to have with us uh, two physicians. Dr. Shannon Sullivan, who is a sleep specialist at Stanford University in California, and Dr. Casey Lee, who is a sleep specialist and surgeon in Palo Alto. Um, thank you both very much for joining us today to talk about this uh, uh, subject matter. There is, uh, we were talking a little bit before getting together, there's a little bit of misinformation out there. We hope today to provide some clarity to our patient population and to everyone about what UARS is. So I'm going to kick it off with Dr. Sullivan, please. Talk to us a little bit about what UARS is, what those letters stand for, the acronym stands for, and about it being different than um, obstructive sleep apnea. Well, thank you very much, Justine, for um, inviting us uh, together to talk about this. UARS stands for Upper Airway Resistance Syndrome. Um, and your question about is it different than obstructive sleep apnea or OSA uh, is very relevant. I think as a field, there are different perspectives on that. But let's go back to the start. Um, UARS was first described in 1993. Um, and Essentially, it shares some of the same underlying factors as obstructive sleep apnea. So let's start with obstructive sleep apnea. That's a condition where breathing is interrupted during sleep. Um, and the nature of those interruptions are classified as either apneas, which are stop breathing events, or hypopneas, which are breathing events where the amplitude of airflow is sufficiently reduced um, uh, to meet criteria, and either one wakes up out of sleep or has an arousal, I should say, out of sleep or an oxygen desaturation. UARS um, is a little bit different. Uh, once again, there is uh, there are breathing abnormalities, but they are but these breathing abnormalities are unique. Um, they are not the same as apneas and hypopneas. And in fact, one of the criteria for UARS is that these events do not meet criteria for hypopneas or apneas. So they're fun, these uh, underlying constituent events are, are fundamentally different. Uh, well, what are they? These uh, same underlying sort of risk factor, there's increased resistance in the upper airway. But in this case, um, the, the events are, are uh, um, paired with increased respiratory um, effort and arousals out of sleep. Um, and what's really unique about upper airway resistant events, which are called respiratory uh, arrears or re respiratory effort related arousals, is that they are marked by considerable flow limitations. So these events are recognizable on overnight sleep studies, but you have to be looking at the uh, nasal uh, uh, signal to be able to see uh, these events. Now, taking kind of bundling that together, what actually is occurring is that an individual is having very fragmented sleep. And many of the symptoms of upper airway resistance syndrome are related to, we believe are related to that sleep fragmentation. So when I heard you talk about um, uh, upper respiratory, I heard you mention um, nasal nose, this area. Can you just talk to our community about um, you know, how the nose and the mouth maybe are, are, are working together and what is happening with, with, with UARS. Because, um, you know, I, I think sometimes we talk about, you know, are people mouth breathers? And, you know, sometimes you kind of, you know, the average person I know, you know, myself, I don't really think about where I'm breathing from or how all of this is working and connected together. Yeah, great point. Um, so, you know, we, we can achieve a breathing through either our nose or our mouths. However, the normal way to breathe is through one's nose. Um, and if you have a source of increased resistance um, through the nasal or nasal pharyngeal airway, 
you will you may revert to mouth breathing and especially if that happens early in life that may become such a chronic situation that you're not even aware of the degree to which you are mouth breathing and of course breathing is achieved a gas exchange is achieved and so um, this can go on for some time before um, before it's picked up why we ask very very frequently about mouth breathing and sleep clinic is that um, it gives us a, a sense it gives us a window into what might be going on in the upper airway it, so right away when i hear that someone is a chronic mouth breather i'm thinking well what's wrong with the nose is there a structural restriction is there inflammation what what's the problem um, and especially if we find out that that symptom is happening for uh, chronically or over a long period of time that's something we want to dig into and so upper airway, just so I'm clear, is pretty much your nose, like this going down from your nose into everything else, right? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, um, everything up to the right, everything through the nose and the back of the throat. Um, it's, 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 it's a complicated real estate. Good thing we have Casey here on the call <laughs> who can speak about it a little bit more. But, the, um, but a lot of times what you'll see is that um, folks who have UARS have um, restricted nasal airflow. And again, um, you know, with behind the tongue collapse, um, you're more often, you're more likely to see things like obstructive apneas, complete cessation of airflow, or hypopneas, where you have a substantial reduction in airflow. In UARS, you, you really don't have uh, the same degree of amplitude reduction um, in terms of airflow, but what you have is greatly increased effort and very frequently uh, fragmented sleep. Right. And if we have time, um, it would be great to talk a little bit about the difference because your, your question about obstructive sleep apnea and UARS is really relevant. In fact, our as the as sleep medicine has learned about UARS, both what are the differences and what are the similarities, um, we you know uh, we've changed our thinking on how it how what the relationship is with obstructive sleep apnea. And in fact, in the ICSD three, the most recent um, diagnostic manual that we have. UARS is lumped together with obstructive sleep apnea. So at least if you're reading the guidebook, um, these conditions are lumped together. But as we'll talk about clinically, they're very different. Got it. it well, before we, we got set here on, on the video stream, I was talking with, with Dr. Lee, and he was providing me with some information about UARS. And we were talking a little bit about AHI, which you had mentioned earlier, um, you know, and that's the the number that most people get from their from their sleep study that they have to you know help uh, indicate something, uh, a diagnosis. And um, you know, I was going to start off this video with me sharing my UARS story. My AHI is 27, and you know, I was having a lot of GERD issues, and I got on a CPAP machine, and I was going to give that whole thing. And and then Dr. Lee kind of enlightened me that if my AHI is actually that high, I probably don't have UARS. <laughs> I probably actually have OSA, um, but I've just been saying that for, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why. So I was really interested to, to hear that. So can we talk a little bit about distinguishing, you know, the two from, because obviously you have a sleep study, right, uh, in order to determine whether you have UARS or OSA, and kind of what maybe that testing uh, um, results look like, the difference between the two. Yeah, absolutely. So first, let's talk about testing, and then let's talk about how the presentation is different. Um, and the testing front, again, um, you know, I think the relationship between hypopneas in particular and RERAs, respiratory effort-related arousals, um, can be as small as what's the amplitude reduction on the nasal signal. And, 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 and we have criteria for a cutoff, but how those criteria are applied may, may vary a little bit. Um, hypopneas with arousals and RERAs are both going to create, are both going to be marked by that sleep fragmentation, but hypopneas more likely are going to have oxygen desaturations uh, associated with them, whereas RERAs typically do not. Um, you can have snoring or no snoring with RERAs, which is another interesting distinction. So we don't, just because someone is not a loud snorer, nightly snorer, we, we wouldn't necessarily think that meant that they didn't have a sleep-related breathing disorder. We might still be going after um, uh, uh, testing. Now, on the clinical side, folks with UARS um, do present differently. We tend to see upper airway resistance syndrome and younger, leaner individuals, and they tend to present with different complaints and symptoms. Um, now, they, they may have sleepiness, 
They may have fatigue, but there are also important associations with dysautonomias, things like cold hands and feet, um, orthostatic hypotension, or that, that um, feeling of a dizziness if you stand up quickly in particular. There may be other nonspecific symptoms, maybe mood symptoms, such as depressive symptoms, uh, maybe GI or gastrointestinal um, symptoms as well. So some of those things overlap with the sort of classic prototypical OSA um, presentation, and some of them don't. Um, and again, these folks can visit their physicians and complain of these symptoms and not necessarily be picked up as having a sleep-related breathing disorder because they're, because you may not get that loud nightly snoring and you don't you certainly don't get a history of stop breathing events. You've witnessed apneas. Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, uh, just just to recap quickly, I I lost my voice. I I you know just I was just going about going to work in my daily life, and you know it hadn't changed anything. And all of a sudden, like my my voice was just gone. Like it was just squeaky, and I couldn't really talk. So I went to the ENT, um, who uh, was telling me it was reflux based. And, you know, first I started off taking all this type of, you know, an acid uh, uh, you know, medication, and it wasn't really helping at all. I was taking a lot of it, and, um, and I never really had that experience, you know, the physical feeling of all of that stuff. So it didn't seem like that was exactly the cause. And, and, you know, for me. And then the second time I, when I went back and he mentioned that, well, it's probably happening while you sleep, um, considering my husband uh, was a sleep apnea patient and my daughter and I had been out to, you know, Stanford uh, with them for, you know, seeking care. I was like, oh, boy, I'm going to have to get a sleep study now. <laughs> if something's happening when I sleep. And so, you know, that's when I, you know, got uh, on on uh, on that course. So um, of my treatment. So um, so is, you know, it seems to me that UARS from what you said is 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 just as serious as OSA because you're having this fragmented sleep that you described and you were having uh, maybe some similar daytime uh, uh, symptoms like, you know, the sleepiness, the fatigue, maybe mood. That's what a lot of OSA patients. But some of those other things that you had mentioned are, you know, we don't hear with OSA, the dizziness when standing up and, and things like that. So it sounds to me like it's just a, a serious for someone to work with their, with their physician on. Yeah, that's such, such a great point. Um, so a, a couple interesting things about your story. First of all, um, we talked about there being increased respiratory effort um, in, in RERAs, the kind of underlying events of UARS. And, you know, you're capable in sleep of generating very big negative inspiratory pressures in the chest to overcome whatever the resistance is in the upper airway. And those big negative pressure swings can predispose to reflux. And so people may present with reflux or sore throat, burning throat. But, um, and you can take the antacids. The problem is if you're not getting to the underlying cause or the underlying source of why it is that you might be having um, those symptoms, you may not seek a treatment resolution. The other interesting thing is that first description of, uh, you, of uh, upper airway resistance syndrome back in 1993 was actually a study of individuals who had been diagnosed as having idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, and they were restudied and found to have uh, th this underlying um, condition. Idiopathic hypersomnia is a, is a diagnosis of excessive daytime sleepiness without a known cause. So, um, you know, sleepiness can occur, but you are right. Um, these other, sim uh, other symptoms that are harder necessarily to tie um, immediately to uh, sleep breathing disorder can, can be there. And overarching fatigue. The other one I hear a lot in clinic is no matter how much I sleep, I'm never refreshed. That non-restorative, unrefreshing sleep is really a hallmark of upper airway resistance syndrome. Now, that can be seen in sleep apnea as well. But um, to your point, um, the degree of symptomatology can be just as serious with UARS as it is with sleep apnea. So let's talk with Dr. Lee about um, treating UARS a little bit. Um, you know, as I said before for myself, uh, whether I actually have it or not, <laughs> um, I, I chose to uh, use CPAP therapy. My, my husband was using it. My daughter was using it. So it was very familiar to me. You know, other people, it's a, it's, it might be a little bit more intimidating or daunting. But what, what, what are some of the treatments that are out there to help people that have this uh, 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 airway resistance? Well, uh, first, 
when you talk about CPAP and Shannon knows knows it very very well, obviously, is that whenever I talk to patients, whether I'm treating them for sleep apnea or URS, I always tell them that CPAP is always the first line treatment. I always recommend CPAP. And what I typically tell people is that if they're willing to use it, they're able to tolerate it and they benefit from it, that'll be their best treatment. Now, historically, UAR, the treatment of UARS has um, been fairly challenging because you can imagine that when patients come in, they have quote unquote relatively minor uh, sleep study results. So these patients have very low HI and a lot of times and they've been uh, told that they don't have sleep disorder breathing. So, um, you know, if you're going to offer surgery, you need to be, you know, need to tread very lightly because you wouldn't want to offer anything too invasive because a lot of times we're, we, unless they have had a good sleep study um, that actually uh, tells you uh, how, how much rarers they have and, and what's the esophageal pressure that that's they're generating, uh, it's very difficult to discern whether this person actually has UARS or uh, no, uh, no sleep disorder breathing. Now, the treatment of URS and sleep apnea are, are fairly similar. As you mentioned, uh, sleep apnea uh, treatment is CPAP and so is URS. In the old days, you know, a uh, few years back, uh, I, taking care of these patients are actually a little bit more challenging in terms of URS because they don't typically have the obvious anatomic abnormalities such as in patients with uh, sleep apnea as excessive soft tissues, um, uh, significant jaw deformity and that sort of thing. So uh, back, back in the days, I will offer you know, some oral appliance treatment, maybe very limited soft tissue surgery. Um, but the past few years, I think we're really focusing on nasal surgery, sort of improvement of nasal airway uh, whether uh, it's improvement of nasal septum, turbinate reduction, uh, or recent years, I, I do a lot of the, the nasal maxillary expansion. I found that to be uh, very, um, quite helpful in most patients. And so with the treatment of URS is because of, of the low AHI, um, again, you have to be a little careful in terms of not that pa these patients don't have some significant uh, um, problems, but treat treatment uh, can be a bit challenging uh, simply because a lot of people will say, well, why are you doing this, this, and that for someone with almost normal sleep studies? Uh, but in, in summary, I think that uh, you want to really focus on improvement of nasal airway, whether it's uh, nasal surgery alone or expansion of the nasal cavity with uh, maxillary expansion. None of these surgeries are very invasive. Uh, they're usually outpatient surgeries, and they can be quite, uh, quite helpful in the uh, URS patients. Okay. Yeah, I think someone had mentioned before, I, I can't remember if it was uh, Dr. Lee or Dr. Sullivan about in regards to CPAP um, using more like the nasal masks, because that seems to be obviously with UARS, it's more of, of, of the issue being more, you know, with the nose, so to speak, than, you know, covering your whole mouth with the full, with a full face mask. Did I say that? Did I say that right for anyone that wants to chime in? Yeah, that's exactly right, Justine. The, um, you can see the difficulty. Casey's right. We always try CPAP. If we can get away with CPAP, that definitely is the gold standard therapy. And remember that the nose, uh, much of upper airway resistance in normal airways resides in the, in the nasal uh, cavity, um, in the nasal pharyngeal airspace. So if you have anatomic factors that make that space even more resistive, um, it's a great target for therapy, but also it can be hard to tolerate CPAP. Uh, there are a lot of folks who want to give it a good college try, and really the nose is just so impaired, it's, it's really hard to accept the CPAP therapy. But we never make that assumption. We always give it a try. You'd be surprised at what people can do <laughs> uh, in mm -hmm. terms of that. And we really do try to avo avoid the oral nasal, uh, meaning the full face masks, if we can. We, what we really want to do is achieve that normal um, airway pattern of uh, nasal breathing. Yeah. 
Well, I, sh I should just mention here that, you know, for anyone that's out there struggling with their CPAP use, the American Sleep Apnea Association has the Awake Peer Mentor Program, which we set um, new CPAP users or struggling CPAP users with veterans over the telephone. So you can, so they can share their stories of, you know, how they dealt with all of the stuff that happens with, you know, using a CPAP machine, the leaks, the the noises, the not understanding the actual machine. And right now, you know, with uh, COVID still uh, protocols still happening, it's a great way to, you know, get in touch with someone safely and 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 be able to get that that help and training that you need. Because sometimes that is the biggest barrier to having success with with CPAP. I know for me, uh, like I said, that I ended up taking the CPAP machine. I was very familiar with it with my my, with my family. And I had always thought that I slept well, you know, even though obviously I had the sleep study to say my age, I was 27. I, you know, yeah, I was tired when I woke up at six in the morning and the alarm went off. And yeah, after lunch, you know, I probably could have taken a nap, you know, but you know, I felt, you know, that's sometimes what most people feel, I think, you know, which maybe isn't really that normal. And then once I got on the CPAP machine, I was especially surprised at how I didn't have that afternoon slump. You know, like I didn't feel like, oh, you know, after you ate or something, like I was like, oh, okay. I didn't feel that anymore. I, you know, I thought that that was really, um, I didn't, wasn't expecting that part of the equation with using the therapy. So, you know, that was, that was definite. Um, you know. um, what about, so if you think that you eventually get OSA, is it a precursor to, you know, having that develop later on? I mean, as we... <laughs> As we all age, everything seems to become looser, less firm. Less. And so do you just eventually roll into that or is it too not necessarily combined? My two cents, I don't think we know, but my two cents on that is both. Um, there are some folks who have UARS that will over time for women, perhaps at menopause or for either men or women with substantial weight gain, um, go on to develop classical OSA, um, but not everybody does. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we take every patient at one patient at a time and try to do the best we can to treat, um, to treat their particular sleep disorder breathing and, and knowing that um, we need to follow them over time. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree with Shannon in that, you know, years back, people would say, well, it's a continuum of UARS and gradually progress with sleep ap into sleep apnea. I, I don't think that's really the case. I think there are, there's some uh, a subgroup of patients that may do that, as what, mentioned, uh, as, uh, what Shannon mentioned. But I think that uh, it, it really is quite different. Again, it, it, it's going to go into some uh, more of a neurologic uh, type of factors. But... Um, I don't. I don't think that every patient with UARS is going to ultimately develop sleep apnea. Okay. Okay. That's 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 interesting. So it it sounds to me that you know if if someone was out there, if a patient was out there looking, you know, for some answers for their daytime symptoms, you know, this this kind of sleepiness, fatigue, you know, um, not really feeling like you know they can kind of you know make it productively through the day. They're just, you know, so tired and they have a sleep study and it's not really showing like Dr. Lee had mentioned and, and, and you had mentioned Dr. Sullivan, you know, this high AHI, all, all of these types of things that would, you know, would trigger a big red flag that they, you know, still need to be an advocate for themselves with their, with their physicians or, or look for another second opinion or something along those lines that, you know, you're, you're, you're still having symptoms and that, you know, you, maybe you fall into the UARS category. Is that good advice to, you know, to convey to today's community? Can I, I just want, want to make one comment in, in that um, just because your, your sleep study shows that you have, quote unquote, minimal or no sleep apnea, that doesn't mean that you don't have sleep apnea. That may just mean that you had a bad sleep study. Um, so uh, I think that it is, as you mentioned, Justine, it's very important, I think, and, and I see that every day in patients 
nowadays they do their own research. They just they continue to push, and, and I don't think patients should uh, just take uh, from what uh, any sleep physician will say that oh you don't have sleep apnea, uh, you don't fit the criteria, and you know see elks, uh, seek elsewhere. I think. Um, most patients are are very sophisticated nowadays. They will do their own research, and uh, I would I will keep on searching because that's that's what's happening. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Casey. I mean, I think one of the most important <laughs> things that people can do to advocate for themselves in this situation is not stop after they receive a home sleep test because you know things have really changed in the field. And these days, if you're suspected of having a sleep related breathing disorder chances are that evaluation will start with home sleep testing. And I think that there's, you know, we, the merits, the upsides and downsides of that are not for this discussion, but that's commonly done. Remember what we talked about, UARS is a, is a disorder of sleep fragmentation. Well, to measure sleep fragmentation, you need to, as Casey mentioned, be thinking about the neurological part of that, which is EEG. Uh, is the gold standard for that. And so a home test does not measure, do not uh, measure directly arousals from sleep. Um, there's there's uh, one type of home testing that, that has a correlate, but even so um, a home test is gonna measure oxygen desaturations and airflow, um, large airflow perturbations. It's gonna go after this kind of classic obstructive sleep apnea. And so what you don't want is for, as a patient is to be told because your home test did not provide a diagnosis of sleep apnea, you're normal. You don't need to press any further. Again, getting back to breast tax, if you sleep enough hours and you do not feel refreshed or you are fatigued or sleepy during the day, there's something going on and you need to push and figure out what that is. And maybe it's sleep-related breathing disorder, maybe it's something else, but it's, um, you know, you got to get back to the fundamentals, which is that you're not feeling good um, and, and, and figure that out. Yeah. So the next I think step, that, 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 yeah, no, I was just going to add on. So, and that, that, that's, Casey made such a great point. You know, what do you do in that situation? The next step is that you may need in-lab sleep testing. You may need a, a gold standard test to really evaluate um, what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's great advice. Um, you know, it's we have talked about with our community over over the years the 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 nuances of the sleep study and the scoring and you know kind of the lab that you're everything that encompasses that and then home sleep studies came in and so you know it's 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 getting back to the main point of. I'm still not feeling well. <laughs> I'm still not, you know, I'm still having these symptoms. You, you know, you may have said I don't have A, but I'm, I'm still, I'm having something else. And, you know, I think, I think people should, you know, strongly consider, you know, like you said, a CPAP machine is, is non-invasive, you know, I mean, yes, you know, you have to get used to it and so on and so forth, but maybe give it a try, you know, talk with your doctor about giving it a try to see if, you know, you can, uh, you can use it and, and, and it rectifies the symptoms that you're having and you'll feel better. You know, um, it's, it's a good place to, to, to start, uh, you know, I think is also good advice, you know, so. Well, are there any closing uh, thoughts before we, before we wrap up with our community, Dr. Lee? Dr. Well, um, I just want to take 10 seconds to, to pay homage to Dr. Christian Gimeno. And uh, obviously, we wouldn't be here without him. And he was a mentor to, uh, to Shannon and myself. And uh, talking about URS, I, um, I was just preparing a lecture and with going through some of the photos of, of him. Uh, when we're talking about URS and, and sleep apnea, and I could just picture Christian saying, no, 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 it's, that's not the case. So, uh, but uh, happy to be here to talk about something that I think is very important uh, that uh, the Christian uh, first described in 93. Dr. Sullivan? Man, I couldn't have said it better myself, Casey. I 100% <laughs> agree. It, um, it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you today, and uh, I owe that to, to Dr. Gimeno as well. He um, was quite, quite an inspiration. And, you know, I think um, when, when you talk about persistence and you talk about recognizing the symptoms and knowing there's something going on and just not, you know, not taking no for an answer, pursuing until you, until you find therapy. Uh, that's something that he instilled in both of us. And I think it's um, a big career changing. Yeah. And, well, I want to really thank 
I want to thank both of you so much. You have helped our community over the years by participating in some of our uh, patient summits that we've had and, you know, doing some other videos previously for us. I want to thank both of you very much for, for joining us again and getting this information out to our sleep apnea community so we can, you know, help as many people, um, you know, uh, improve their lives and, and, and feel good through, throughout the day. So I want to thank you so much for joining us. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Check us out at sleepapnea.org. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Be an awake angel and you can help those financially impacted by COVID-19. Just $50 can provide two CPAP masks to someone in need. Please visit sleepapnea.org slash donate for details. The ASAA is a patient-focused organization. Please like and subscribe to our YouTube page, join us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram or sleepapnea.org and you can join the conversation. It's all free.